Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Can, Head of Mining General Research, and with me I have Hayden Locke, Chief Executive of Maramaka Copper. Hi, Hayden. Hi, Chris. Maramaka released its PEA on its namesake project in Chile last year, uh, based on only oxide resources. The MPV came back at more than 520 million, with a IRR of 33.5% based on the open pit operation. It also published some really interesting uh, regional exploration results or interpretations, um, and that's essentially what we're looking to focus on today. Um, Hayden, you've talked about it being an IOCG uh, district potentially. Um, for the uninitiated, what is an IOCG district or deposit style and why do you think it could be um, it could be a district st uh, scale copper um, region? Uh, so IOCG is just a, um, a type of copper gold deposit, um, iron oxide copper gold. Um, you know, it really refers to the amount of sort of magnetite and hematite and other, other iron rich uh, elements that you find in there. Um, you know, that's a simplistic way of looking at it. The, you know, I think the reason that it's interesting, number one, is these projects can have pretty significant scale. I mean, the, the, the real one to note is Olympic Dam, which is absolutely enormous. Not saying that we're going to find that, or I hope so, but, uh, yeah. you know, they can be absolutely enormous. But I think the other really interesting thing about them is you know, the genesis of them is driven by large regional structures. And so what tends to happen is where you find one IOCG type deposit, you can find repetitions of that along the same structures. And if those structures are very large regional structures, um, you can find you know, quite large numbers of these, of these things. Now varying in scale, uh, but there are examples in Chile, um, especially further to the south of us around Candelaria and those things, which is owned by Lundin, where you have clusters of IOCGs. Um, and so really that's what's exciting for us is, okay, we found one and uh, that's been successful and we've only really drilled out the oxide cap at the top of it, uh, but we're now looking further afield and, and into the broader region where we've identified the key, what we think are the key regional structures, uh, which could potentially host another Maramaka style mineralization. And so that's what the exploration work has been focused on outside of Maramaka is really target generation. Okay. And I understand there's quite a high level of confidence that um, below Maramaka, below the oxide um, deposit and the, you know, what, what is uh, the uh, underpins the PEA as it stands, um, there's sulfide resources or you're confident that there'll be, um, you'll be able to drill out a sulfide resource and you've also got some these regional targets that you're talking about that align themselves with these regional structures um, what kind of work's been done to help you form that view uh, confidence is a dangerous word with exploration uh, because you never really know until you put a drill hole in it but uh, there's all there is absolutely a sulfide uh, zone sitting below Maramaka because that's how that's how this deposit would have been emplaced. Um, the question is, how broad is it? How well does it hang together? I mean, we do have drilling that has gone through uh, the bottom of the oxide deposit and into the sulfide zone that's delivered some very interesting results. Uh, you know, we're talking broad zones of plus 1% copper. And our most recent announcement on this was 116 plus meters at over 0.5%. Uh, so certainly a lot of smoke there. But again, the big question is how well does that hang together? And we won't know that until we until we start to drill it out more. We do have drill holes in the labs at the moment, uh, results pending, and uh, so we're hopeful that that shows us that there's something meaningful there that's, uh, that could be an economic deposit sitting below uh, Maramaka. Um, so how do we think about it? Look, it's classic exploration where we're using all of the information from... We, the benefit we have here is we've drilled... Maramaka extensively. So we have a lot of information around the controls and mineralization, the structure, the mineralogy, all of that. And then we've overlain that actually the other way, the opposite way to what most exploration is with with uh, more geophysical methods, so magneti magnetism and, and um, downhole geophysics. Uh, and that's really, we think, given us a very strong geological model um, as to what's happening at Maramaka, first of all, and then also what's potentially happening in the areas around uh, Maramaka. But what I would say is I've never had the experience of a 
geological model that hasn't continually changed over time as more information has become available. And so as we drill, no doubt it'll be updated and we'll, get, we'll have new ideas and hypotheses about how this uh, deposit was formed and therefore what the perspectivity is like for additional tonnes to add to our mine life. Okay, and the main regional targets at the moment are Mercedes and Cindy. How far away are they? Have they had any drilling uh, to this point? And what's the plan to put some holes in those ones and, and, and get some answers? Uh, so we actually have a new target as well. So we've got Mercedes, Cindy and the Roble target, which is a, a new target off to the northeast. All of them are within five kilometres of, of Maramaca, so close enough that if we were to make a discovery, they could be developed together. Obviously a big if there. Uh, you know, each of those is very interesting in and of themselves. And, and I, I think I should point out we're really focused on oxide first uh, because that immediately adds value to our current project. Uh, but we're, of course, looking for sulphide as well, uh, you know, hoping that there will be s something significant from a sulphide perspective because that's how you really get significant mine life extension. Uh, for the Mercedes and Cindy's targets, uh, there are historical artisanal mines there. Um, so we have a lot of evidence, but none of it has been drilled. And this really comes into a bit of a discussion as to how did we discover Maramaca uh, when nobody else did. But they've never been drilled, but there has been historical operations. So we have quite a lot of information uh, on each of those. There are a lot of similarities between those targets and what we've seen at Maramaca. And so we're going to be drilling the Cindy target uh, imminently. Um, so and, and I would expect we'll have drilled all of these targets before the end of June this year and we'll hopefully have results back and therefore have an idea as to whether or not there is something that adds significantly to Maramaca or not. Okay, and you touched on that important point there. Um, there is a fair bit of smoke already with artisanal workings. Um, you're close to uh, or almost within um, a prolific, um, probably the world's most prolific copper producing region. With all, with all the signals that you've had to date that have got you this far, how on earth haven't other explorers, existing producers already developed this ground? Yeah. It's amazing. And I mean, this is the best thing about exploration is just when you think that uh, it's, there's no more exploration success to be had, uh, geology confounds you again. But the, the real reason here is this part of Chile, the general rock units that you would be looking for a big bulk scale copper mining project are typically volcanics. Um, and so you're looking for either the big porphyries or the, or the manto style uh, projects like Mantos Blancos, which are hosted in volcanic units, and the rock units that we're talking about are intrusives. So they haven't they haven't come out of the Earth's surface, and uh, the generally accepted wisdom on those, especially in this part of of Chile, was the copper mineralization. There's always there's copper mineralization everywhere, but in this certain rock unit, the generally accepted wisdom was it would be narrow, sort of high grade vein type things. Um, so nothing that's really going to get a company that wants to do bulk mining and have you know really low costs excited and Maramaca Maramaca has been known about for a long time and it was just Sergio was the first person to come up with a different geological model and decide to drill it and uh, that's been incredibly successful but I think the the, the key driver here is uh, it's driven by the structural controls of this deposit so a highly fractured uh, intrusive rock unit um, that's been flooded by uh, hydrothermal fuel, fluids and created this uh, large-scale copper deposit, and that is that is not the generally accepted wisdom of this part of Chile. So that's that's the genesis of it, and you know we're very lucky to get our hands on it. Okay, and um, you're talking about the oxide potential and exploration program, which will run ahead of the sulphide. When you're looking to actually bring the uh, an operation. Um, into production and obviously investors are going to want to see that as soon as possible and see some returns as soon as possible. How do you work the program around um, building an operation based on oxides and then something with sulfides, obviously given that they'll require different infrastructure? Yeah, uh, I think the part of the uniqueness of Maramaca is that it is an all oxide deposit and that has several knock-on benefits, um, but the most obvious one is much lower capital intensity relative to a concentrator. And so we don't want to change that. And so even if we make a huge sulfide discovery, we would most likely still develop the oxide as a standalone project, um, which is why we have a high focus on finding more oxide tons to feed into this mine plan. 
Um, so how would it change? It wouldn't change is, is the short answer. Um, you know, I think we would still focus on developing this oxide as quickly as we possibly can. Now, where the, where a, a fantastic headache to have would come in is if we make a big oxide discovery that could meaningfully change the scale of the oxide project that we have. Um, because as of right now, it's a wonderful project. Its only weakness is it's just a little bit small, sub the 50, sort of 50,000 tonne rule of thumb to start getting people excited. If we make a significant oxide discovery, we may look to upscale. And um, th that would be a nice problem to have, but it would probably delay us a little bit in terms of developing this project. Uh, but there's been no decisions made, obviously, because we haven't drilled anything yet to find out if there is something that warrants an upscale. Okay. And you touched on the program a, a bit. What are the actual timelines and milestones that people need to be on the lookout for in terms of exploration and getting numbers back? So we're drilling the, the sulphide target below Maramaka at the moment. Uh, that's that's actually finished the first phase of drilling there. Uh, we've got the first drill hole back, waiting on the final four drill holes to come back. Uh, then we'll move straight up to the Cindy target and drill that. Uh, so eight drill holes there, 250 metres deep, so relatively quick. Uh, and then either the Mercedes or Roble target, depending on which one's ready first, uh, and then obviously moving to the other one. But we will have all of those targets tested, we would expect, by the end of June. Uh, and so then we'll be in a position to say, okay, we we got something that's interesting um, and we will potentially slow down the commencement of the feasibility study uh, or we haven't and we'll crack on with the feasibility study with the aim of getting this project into production as soon as we possibly can. Okay, and when you say um, commencement of feasibility and then completion, obviously decision on um, taking it forward and then into production ASAP, what does that broadly look like without nailing yourself down to, uh, to too much of a commitment on timing? Uh, well, the critical path is the permitting, and that's kind of linked to the feasibility study uh, in, in Chile. Um, and so we need to start the feasibility study before we have a kind of view on where that would be. But based on our current timelines and our expectations of the permitting regime that will fall under, we would expect we could be uh, permitted and have delivered the feasibility study by the middle of 2022. Uh, and then obviously financing and, uh, and getting ready to kick off. Um, it's not inconceivable that we could be con commencing construction in 2022. There's a lot of ifs uh, around that and a, and a lot of question marks over, you know, what will happen if, you know, we're doing an option study at the moment to make sure we're nailing down the best possible design basis for the feasibility study. If things will change, I've got no doubt. They always do. And, uh, you know, some of those changes could delay that. Some of those changes could accelerate that. So, that, But that's the internal target at the moment. Hayden Locke, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Chris.